One of the narratives that's coming out of this 2024 election is this idea that Trump won this blowout victory. Uh, we're hearing this um, not not even just from his supporters, but a lot of political observers in general talking about it. It was this big, big victory. He's got a mandate to rule now. It wasn't even close. Well, I think if we, we look at the, the numbers a little bit more closely, it, it seems that it was, in fact, pretty close, uh, just in terms of, of course, the popular vote, just kind of the general idea of which side is the majority with. Well, uh, Trump's going to come in at under 51 percent, probably more like 50.5 percent. And you might say, well, what about the Electoral College? OK, yeah, that's going to be less close, but it just it's a way of weighting the popular vote. It's not like it's some totally separate number. And the closeness of it, I think, is more illustrated when we look at had just a few hundred thousand votes been changed, of course, this is out of 150 million voters, just a few hundred thousand votes changed in, say, two or three uh, uh, states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, for example, the outcome would have been totally different. You would have had Kamala as your president. And this highlights uh, something that we should note also in this election is that Kamala could have easily been president with three of those states changing slightly. Meanwhile, you would have had whole swaths of the country that had voted overwhelmingly against her. So the question is, in a democratic system, should it should it be that you can have large parts of the country vote two to one against the victor and then just be told to shut up uh, and that the other side has a mandate after they win. And so here's some examples, right? In uh, Wyoming was the biggest victory for uh, Trump in this election. He got 72 percent of uh, the vote there. OK, that's a real small state, the smallest state. Uh, and that's not the case everywhere, though. In fact, 13 states overall uh, voted with these lopsided majorities for Trump. These weren't all tiny states. At least states had five million or more people that were voting for Trump in like 62, 63 percent, sometimes a little bit more, uh, and then the other side getting around 30 percent. So what that means, though, is in the end is that they could lose, and then the other side comes in and then starts issuing executive orders that have full effect within the boundaries, the borders of each of those states. And so it doesn't matter who you vote for, no matter how big a majority it is, in many parts of the country, you still have to submit to what is essentially rule by decree to the eventual presidential winner. Uh, and that, of course, is the world we live in today, right? It's not like states can therefore, oh, well, I'm, I'm Utah and I have my small handful, my congressional delegation of a few people that they could somehow limit presidential power. They can't. Congress hardly does anything in modern America to limit presidential power. And presidents, uh, because Congress does so little and is usually deadlocked and has so little legislation that they actually debate other outside of these huge omnibus bills which, of course, are all written to reflect the, uh, the desires of the, the, the national interest groups that function mostly in Washington. You can be one of these states, and really the, the, what affects you coming out of the White House are these, uh, these executive orders. That's how most of the governance happens today. As presidents come in, and they rule by decree. They issue these, these orders. So it doesn't really matter then if your vote if your state votes 65 percent. And we see many examples of this in real life. Back in 2012, back in 2012, for example, that was the Mitt Romney uh, Obama contest. Utah, for example, voted over 70 percent in favor of Mitt Romney and 10 states overall voted 60 percent or more in favor of Mitt Romney. You didn't have as much enthusiasm in those cases, usually on the other side. For this, for example, this time in 2024, only one state voted 60% or more in favor of Kamala. So that shows you kind of the enthusiasm at work there. But, you, but what, you get 10 states now that vote two to one against Obama in 2012, too bad. You have to have, uh, you have to submit to Obama's rule by decree. Now, of course, we're gonna hear, oh, well, rules is rules. That's what they're gonna say. You gotta follow the rules. All right. Well, those rules are premised on the idea that uh, people are that the, the the desires and wants and preferences of people are somehow reflected in the outcome of the vote. But guess what? Their their desire was two to one against the victor. And so it's hard to see how this will of the majority or whatever is being reflected in the actual Vote and and of course theorists of democracy have never really been able to show how 
the uh, whatever it is that the will of the voters is. Of course, there is never any unified will of the voters. But what is this and how is it translated into policy done uh, and at some distant location by some single politician? That's, this has never been explained and never shown. In fact, lots of data shows that representation is mostly a farce, that uh, the way uh, politicians rule is based on pressure groups and on fundraising and a variety of policy, uh, uh, other issues that have been shown to be quite divorced from whatever it is that the voters back in their district actually say they want. Now, what this whole system tells me is that you can have just huge millions of Americans who hate President X, but end up with President X. And what happens if this happens over and over again? That no matter how they vote, they end up with someone who is against their regional interests, against, against, against the interests of their state, against a lopsided majority of voters in their state. What does that mean? Well, in America, you can never leave. So the illegitimacy of this system, I think, is really highlighted by the fact that no matter how much the central government ignores the vote uh, in your state and how much voters in your state might be voting against the victor, too bad. You could never leave. It doesn't matter. Uh, how much you want something else, you're stuck till the end of time. This is essentially the position. This is the anti-secessionist position. Now, imagine if the private sector conducted things this way, right? Imagine you were you held a large stake in a public company and the management just started doing tons of things you hated. And they came back and say, well, you can never sell your shares and leave. You're, you're stuck, invested with this no matter what. Uh, clearly that wouldn't happen. Imagine a private club where you're paying dues and then uh, a new regime comes in and, and you feel like they're wasting your money. Too bad you could never leave. You have to keep paying dues until the end of time. This is, this is the American political system, essentially. You have to keep, no matter if 100% of the people in your state voted against the eventual presidential winner, too bad. You got to keep paying taxes forever till the end of time. This is essentially the American ideology, is that no matter how much you get screwed over by the central government, you're never allowed to exit, you're never allowed to leave. Hard to see how that system can be promoted as some sort of morally legitimate system, but that's what we have. Of course, in reality, what this is going to end up with is uh, just increasing efforts to decentralize the American state, to break pieces off. I mean, Americans are already really self-sorting into different states and making efforts to live amongst, quote-unquote, their own kind uh, politically. And we are seeing real empirical evidence of that happening. And so if you're in these places that is voting overwhelmingly against the majority in the long term, that leads to disunion, that leads to political problems. In the short term, I have no doubt you can kind of patch it over and you can promise that, oh, we're going to have unity soon and I'm going to give everybody what they want. That's just simply not the reality. And that was papered over a lot in the mid-20th uh, century during the, the so-called liberal consensus, and media was carefully controlled. Uh, and that's why you hear so much now about censorship and why the left wants to control what you can hear through social media or any other media, is they're afraid that it will cause uh, significant divisions among the population. But we're already heading toward that. And over time, uh, people are going to figure out that no matter what they do, they're going to get someone that hates them in office and is going to rule them uh, in a way that is totally contrary to their interests. Time and time again, we see that no state survives that sort of thing uh, beyond the medium term. Uh, so that that does look like that is the direction the U.S. is headed. Now, a lot of Trump uh, supporters are going to be complacent. They're going to think that things are different now that our guy won. Well, he can't run again. He's going to be gone in 2028, which is just a few years away. And I'm very skeptical that there's been some fundamental change. I think what we're going to see in uh, the next couple of elections after that is, yet again, a repeat of this idea that you can have a dozen or more states that are voting overwhelmingly against the victor and in the end are told to just shut up and take whatever it is Washington dishes out to you. And I just don't think uh, the United States can continue down that road indefinitely. Mm -hmm.